Yeah. Since uh, Bart Redford is gone uh, today, tomorrow, uh, Thursday also, he asked that I introduce myself. <laughs> my, my name is Ray Finch. I'm a former Crease alum, former employee of Crease, um, and now I'm working at Fort Leavenworth as an analyst in the Foreign Military Studies Office where I track Eurasian security issues. Mm. As you can see from the title of my presentation, I contend that Sergei Shoigu's appointment as Defense Minister was something quite extraordinary. Some might even say an emergency. Here's a brief roadmap of my remarks, as the question answer is usually the most interesting part of these affairs. I'll try to limit my comments to 25 minutes. As someone who lives in the weeds of Russian security stuff, I'd ask if you have a question along the way, please stop, because I may say something that I take as you would understand, or that you already understand that perhaps you don't. Um, why is this topic important? Uh, first, I think that his appointment says something about the nature of politics in Russia today. I believe that Shoigu serves as an apt metaphor for Russia. He spent the first 20 years of his career responding to domestic emergencies. He knows the strengths and weaknesses of Russia very well. As defense minister, he'll now be charged with responding to both internal and possibly external conflicts. And finally, should the stars align correctly, Mr. Shoigu could become Russia's next leader. We could spend a lot of time on his biography. Uh, he's a very interesting person and has done much during his life over the past 58 years. I've chosen just a handful of images and will treat you to a bit of a Shoigu slideshow. He's a year older than me, born in 1955 out in distant Siberia in the Tuva province. And one can detect his Asian roots in his father's face. This could be a factor if he does run for higher office. His father was a local party boss and was apparently acquainted with a, another party boss in the neighboring region of Sverdlovsk, somebody by the name of Boris Yeltsin. So Shoigu had some early connections and he used that to further his career. As a teenager, you can see him up there, age 14, uh, Shoigu was something of a hooligan. Uh, known, did a lot of things as a youth that probably today he, he might um, uh, not be willing to talk about. But he settled down and pursued his engineer, engineering and a party career. Uh, two things I want to say, the, the woman he married uh, was the wife of a party boss. His father was a party boss. He's used his personal connections uh, to further his career and he has a real talent in that regard. Shoigu came to Moscow in 1990 and took a government job in construction. Uh, his arrival in his position is another apt metaphor. He arrived in the capital of the USSR to help with construction just as the country was falling apart. One might say that he's been working ever since to prevent further collapse. On the slide you can see some of his uh, images from earlier rescue attempts. As the chairman of the newly formed Russian Rescue Corps, in the early 90s he was dispatched to the North Caucasus to help put out an ethnic fire between Georgians and Ossetians. Depending on who you talk to, he was very successful. We could talk a little bit too about what this means for his, his organization, what they're charged to do, but anyway, uh, he has on the ground experience in handling ethnic conflicts. You can see there for almost 20 years he served as the minister of Emercom, which is, I'm not sure, it's sort of like a enhanced Department of Homeland Security FEMA put together. He quickly earned the reputation as an expert rescue worker and convinced the Kremlin leadership to appoint him as the Emercom chairman or minister. Who better to lead the ministry? He gained the reputation of a can-do, hands-on leader. And in a certain sense, he had the perfect job. Russia's infrastructure was constantly breaking down, 
And having assembled a relatively responsive, well-trained and equipped organization, Shoigu and his team could arrive at any disaster scene and render first aid. He didn't have to worry about actually repairing the infrastructure. That wasn't his job. So he soon gained the reputation of something of a savior. Uh, for his excellent service, he has, if you go to Wikipedia or go to his website, he has just about every award uh, that's been created uh, in post-Soviet Russia. He, he, he holds many awards, probably a total of 50. And the one there on the right, he's getting the Hero of Russia Award from Boris Yeltsin in late September 1999, just after a series of mysterious explosions in the capital that killed some 200 people. Uh, Shoigu and his ministry helped to clean up that disaster. Uh, but unlike many other officials associated with the Yeltsin regime, uh, who were criticized for incompetence and corruption, Shoigu was, has been able to avoid these charges. And some of his semi-clean record may be due to his integrity. Much of it is due to his ability to massage the media. He's an expert in that regard, and we can talk about that later. With regard to political maneuvering, he's also extremely clever. He has consistently fostered the impression that, no, my first job is rescue work, emergency services. I don't really care about politics. But he's been equally successful in helping the Kremlin and their Kremlin-friendly parties build the current structure Russia has today. Uh, for instance, in 1996, during Yeltsin's uh, bid for presidency, he was critical in gaining regional support for Yeltsin. He was equally critical in gaining support for Putin uh, in the 2000 election. Uh, the point I want to make is his political endeavors have been substantial in building Russia's current political system. And his longevity in the Kremlin is, in my mind, astounding. There's nobody around today that was around, as close to Putin, that was around at the inception. Uh, how did he do this? Uh, he just has a keen sense of political skills. He knows which way the winds are blowing. And I want to talk about 1999, there he is next to Putin. In 99, you remember, go back to that period, the heavy hitters were maneuvering to take over after Yeltsin stepped down. People like Lushkov, Primakov, Lebet, and a lot of people said Putin didn't have a chance in, among these heavy hitters. Shoigu, the first time he met him, he said, that's where, the, that's where the money is, that's where the power is. And he, he had been a Lushkov supporter, you can see up in that picture, in the, uh, up on the far left there, and he quickly became a Putin supporter. Since Putin's arrival in the Kremlin, Shoigu was either on the front lines or at Putin's side during almost every natural or man-made disaster. Shoigu and his Emercom forces were the visual proof that the Kremlin leadership was doing everything possible to alleviate the suffering of the Russian people. He has demonstrated good and faithful service under Putin. Most importantly, he was very good at his job. This guy is competent. Unlike many other men ministries, his organization was responsive. His PR team is ex was excellent. Again, he's no longer in this role. And he developed the reputation of handling any disaster before the criticism could really get to the Kremlin. Uh, and that, I want to say, worked wonders in uh, Putin's impression of him. Um, and even though he's held high-level positions in all the Kremlin-friendly parties, Budinstva, Adin Rasi, Nashdom Rasi, he's never taken an independent line. He's always followed what the Kremlin uh, The photo on the lower left is from Beslan, uh, just nine years ago this month. And you remember that. You, everybody remembers Beslan, that horrible accident, uh, not accident, terrorist act. And it was and when Putin came, went to Beslan on 4 September, the man he put in charge of the cleanup operation was Shoigu and his Emercom forces. Uh, these type of incidents, in my mind, tend to bind a relationship much closer. To go through something like that together, you have to trust another person pretty closely. Um, as 
a couple of other images. In the popular narrative, under Putin's leadership, Russia has been portrayed as, quote, getting up off her knees after the painful and humiliating 1990s. Instead of the chaotic democracy of the Yeltsin period, the country was now operating under Putin's strict and effective power vertical. There have been a number of disasters, however, which tend to refute this assertion. Uh, the one there on the right and the lower left, that's from the hydroelectric dam out in Siberia, Sayano uh, Shushenskaya, that uh, blew apart in 2009. 2010, there's a case with Medvedev during the Moscow, just after the Moscow metro explosions. To fit into this narrative, however, the disaster had to be portrayed not only as an unavoidable accident, couldn't do anything about it, but that the authorities were quick to respond. In almost every case, Shoigu was adept at getting this message across. I know some of you guys will take me to task. There have been disasters that it has not been so great with the fires of 2010 and 11. But by and large, he was extremely adept at, hey, the power vertical is working. During the past two decades, Russia has had very few soft power tools at its disposal. Shoigu and his emergency ministry is one solid exception. Even when the country was reeling economically during the 1990s, Shoigu and his MCS or Emercom forces would respond to international disasters, whether it was delivering aid to Serbia or rescuing pilots in Africa. These guys put Russia back on the map uh, in a very effective soft power tool. Um, the point I want to stress is that Shoigu has been portrayed as very effective in responding to crisis over the past 20 years. So he's, I, the guy's totally square away. The, the, this image, again, on the right, might be a little bit too harsh, but it captures some of the challenges Shoigu faced as the Minister of Emergency Services. Um, he inherited a mess. You know, any of you who've been to Russia know that the infrastructure is in pretty sorry condition. It was during, specifically during the 90s, and he had the task, you can see him there trying to thread a needle, trying to keep this thing from completely falling apart. Uh, and he's done pretty well. And I think most Russians look at him as a Mr. Fix-It kind of guy. Uh, he has that optimistic, can-do attitude. It paid off in May 2012. Again, Putin had just returned to the throne in the Kremlin. He's now passing out favors. And one of the favors he passed out, he nominated Sergei. You're now going to be the Moscow region governor, which is a huge position. Um, and there was talk at the time that, he, that perhaps Shoigu was being, what I want to say, bred or groomed for the highest position, that he could be, you know, learn the insides of the political system as the Moscow regional governor, and then ultimately perhaps go into the Kremlin. Uh, I don't know if that's the case. He was only in the job for about six months when he got pulled out to become the defense minister. And we can talk about why. Why was he appointed? There he is down at those of you who know Russian ministers of defense, that's starting with Grachov, Radionov, Sergeyev, Ivanov, there's the guy he replaced, Anatoly Sergeyev. What can you tell just from looking at this picture? Certainly, he cuts a much more military image than his immediate predecessor, Sergeyev. Um, but from my perspective, these first five ministers had the unenviable task of somehow reforming this giant Soviet monolith into something that Russia could use as a military force. I think the breakage has been done. It's now going to be Shoigu's task to put this thing together. Uh, they've broken apart the Soviet monolith, uh, and hopefully he'll be able to put it together. Uh, one other point perhaps bears mention. You know, Russia, during the first 20 years of, the, of its existence in its defense ministry, I think their primary task was simply to hold the country together. They're just trying to hold the country together. And as long as they maintain some robust nuclear forces, they could do that. They've been able to do that for 20 years. Shoigu now perhaps can begin to flex muscles in a more conventional sense. And there's talk that perhaps he'll be able to do that. And I want to say, uh, protect what they consider their interest in the 
post-Soviet or sometimes called a year abroad. But why was he appointed? Basically, this guy was totally unpopular. This could be a subject for a whole other brown bag. And Mr. Serdyukov was charged with being incompetent and corrupt. I tend to think he might have been a little bit of both, but you always have to remember that he was acting under the president. He was carrying out President Putin's uh, actions. Uh, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time. He was just very corrupt. You can see him there. This is last May, May 12, 2012, at the Victory Day parade with Putin inspecting the troops. There's a recent poll where he was, you know, uh, rated as the most miserable minister in the government. Uh, and here are just some funny reasons or funny things that I've translated for it. Why was he remote? Uh, some of it were personal. The one on the right talks about Serdyukov was married to one of Putin's close friends, Viktor Zhukov. Uh, unfortunately, Serdyukov was messing around with one of his uh, deputies within the defense ministry. This did not go well with Putin and Putin's close friend, Viktor Zhukov. So there were some personal issues as to why Serdyukov removed. Uh, but most people say he was incompetent. That's uh, the other charge. And again, I'm working on a paper now talking about anti-Americanism. Some people claim that Serdyukov was a stooge. He was an American stooge. There he is receiving an award from Bob Gates, our former uh, Minister of Defense. Uh, and you can see there, he's receiving his overseas passport. Or there's, there's our president saying, today they fired Serdyukov. This is a great loss for the American people. Um, <laughs> But it does bring up the question, Putin was under a lot of pressure. Uh, how could he allow such a scoundrel like Serdyukov to wreck <laughs> such havoc? There was real rumblings in the ranks. Uh, and there was also a growing realization that Serdyukov was not acting independently, that he was carrying out Kremlin-directed reforms. So who was responsible? Well, this one on the lower left there captures some of that sentiment. Pervi Pashol, the first one is gone. Serdyukov is gone. Who's next? Well, it'd be Medvedev and then Putin. For a lot of these arch conservatives, not even arch conservatives, but a lot of conservatives, they did not agree with what was happening in the defense ministry. Uh, so the first one gone. The other one is sort of a joke. Uh, and Putin says, okay, look at I'm going to have to beef up my defense uh, because I'm under some criticism. Um, and one way to do it would be to remove Serdyukov. Those of you who follow Putin's uh, election campaign in late 2011, early 2012, remember one of his campaign statements dealt with improving the overall military potential of the country. And removing Serdyukov and appointing Shoigu could be interpreted as a clear sign that uh, Russia was serious about rebuilding its military. Okay, so how removing Serdyukov appointing Shoigu, how does this affect what I call the Putin-verse, the universe around Putin? And again, for those of you who don't know Russian, it doesn't matter, Putin is the star, the stellar thing around which everything rotates. This is before uh, or, uh, Shoigu's appointment, and you can see that he's over on the liberal side. I don't know liberal is not the right word. I would put the pragmatic side of Russian ideology as opposed to the Siloviki, or maybe the more, the more conservative side of Russia. So he was part, considered part of the old Yeltsin family um, as to where he existed in the Putin universe. Not very close, actually, to uh, Putin. I mean, he was out there, the Ministry of Emergency Affairs. But with his appointment, and again, this is from the Mitchenko report that was about, it's about six months old now, where, again, he's... This is for sort of the Kremlinologist Bible. He's going to tell us where uh, people are in the uh, Kremlin universe. You can see that Shoigu left that. And now he is much closer to Putin. And I just want to read one paragraph from this um, Minchenko report in their description of Shoigu. They call Shoigu the government's chief image locomotive. He is working at an advantageous contrast to Serdyukov and is making rational use of his fame and popularity. Shoigu is perceived as almost a military man. Now again, he doesn't have the traditional military background, um, but 
he now wears a uniform, he certainly portrays himself as a military man. The ministry that he headed is sort of a quasi-military unit. We, we can talk about that in a little bit. But the, the report goes on to say, the Ministry of Defense is rather quickly sliding into the rut created by Sir Dukas, and the minister's personal prestige gives the career military no opportunity to express their displeasure. This Minchenko again, I would say, but, but the minister's personal prestige, we'll talk about in a minute, Shoigu inherited many of the same problems that Sir Dukas had, but previous ministers had, even his popularity is not going to help correct some of the deep infrastructure problems within the military. But he certainly has the reputation as a most effective minister, and he's using this to his advantage. This was, uh, I don't know, a couple, three months ago. You can see there Sergei Shoigu, again, among Russians, who is the most effective minister? He was based top in both these polls. The guy there, number six there, we'll get to in a second, uh, Dmitry Ragozin. Who, uh, who, uh, but anyway, his reputation is serving, certainly serving him well. It's this, though, and again, in the Putin universe, what matters? This doesn't matter so much, although that matters a little bit. What really matters is your proximity to Putin. Russia is not a democracy. It's not a democracy. It's something else. We call it a sovereign democracy. It's not a democracy. Weight is determined where you are in this universe, how close you are to Putin. That determines your political weight. And Shoigu has close proximity. I like this picture um, because of the guy up in the upper left. Again, I, I, I don't know who he is, but I imagine that he's a watchdog of sorts, ready to pounce on anybody who tries to Nam's squeeze in uh, on Pardon? And then on screen. That's right. Um, Shoigu knows how this game is played. He knows it would be suicidal for him to express any sort of presidential aspirations. So he knows he's keeping his card well hid if he hasn't. He certainly understands. Because this is the most important thing in Russia's Putin, Putin's Russia today, that proximity. And again, here are just a handful of images. They have a good, close friendship. Uh, being a dog lover myself, it was Shoigu who gave Putin his first dog back in 2001. You can see that. This is huge for us dog lovers. But they've gone on vacations together. They do sports together. They do all sorts of stuff together. They are, they are close chums, I think. And they have a certain similar worldview. They're both Mujiki, uh, they both are, you know, sort of uh, cut to the chase. The, the, I don't think sophisticated, although Putin is very sophisticated, I don't think sophisticated uh, entertainments are necessarily what they're after. But anyway, I think if they're, they're of the same genre. Uh, what does this all mean? Uh, this photo help us, helps us to understand. Is Shoigu closer to the politics of Putin or the military concerns of the uh, chief of the general staff, Larry Grassi? In my mind, there's no question as to where his loyalties lie. He's always going to answer Putin's phone first. His loyalty is not so much even to the military or to Russia as it is to Putin. And this could have some profound implications down the road. He is totally loyal to Putin. Um, here are a couple of images from this last nine May Day victory parade. You can see he's standing there. I should have put the picture from 2012 with Sergei Kov in the same Zill limousine because he did not cut a very good image at all. And to compare the two, you would say one is very military, the other is not military at all. Um, he cuts an impressive image. There he is standing next to Putin as the uh, review of troops continues. However, despite the elaborate parades and his reputation as that Superman, as I mentioned, he ch faces the ch same challenges as his predecessors. Severe manpower shortages, confu confusion about future structure, housing problems, 
limited research and development, just endemic corruption, etc. He's been in the job for less than a year, uh, and it's probably too soon to offer any sort of final assessment. However, judging from his initial steps, I think he could, I'd say could with a small c, help to improve Russia's military prowess. Uh, he's done a lot of things on the margins to help morale, and I think that that's part, you know, morale is the material as three is the one or ten is the one, as Napoleon said. He's done a good job in that regard. Um, and so finally, uh, two years ago, just less than two years ago, I gave a brown bag title, Dmitry Rago, no, Tsar Dmitry and NATO-Russia Relations, where I examined the life and writings of the guy right there at the upper right, Dmitry Rogozin. When I gave the talk, Rogozin was serving as uh, Russia's representative to NATO. And I made a prediction that he would soon get closer to the Kremlin, because this was November 2011. There was a lot of talk that Putin needs some nationalists. Uh, again, Medvedev was still the president, but everyone knew that Putin was going to replace him. That Putin needed some nationalism in his government uh, to capture that part of the vote. And I predicted that he was going to get closer to the Kremlin. And lo and behold, less than a month later, he was appointed as actually Medvedev, a vice premier in charge of the Russian defense industry, the position he currently holds today. Uh, but in my assessment of looking at Russia, uh, these images present, you know the term triptych? This, you know, the icon, where there's three images, you might have the Virgin Mary, Christ, and you know, some saint on the thing. This is the modern triptych of Russian ideology today. On the right, you have the image of Dmitry Ragozin with his dreams of a militarily strong, somewhat aggressive Russia that's not afraid to throw its weight around to restore what it believes uh, it's their rightful place in the world. On the left, you have the more pragmatic Shoigu. Uh, he's certainly less nationalistic than Ragozin, and he's very well aware of the many domestic challenges that Russia faces. I mean, you can't be the head of the Ministry of Emergency Services for 20 years and not know all of the weaknesses in the country. At the bottom, of course, is President Putin, who shares qualities of both Shoigu and Rogozin. If an election were held tomorrow between these three, who would win? Putin. 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 <laughs> he would win. Uh, However, if the race were between Rogozin and Shoigu, it would be much more interesting. <coughs> Rogozin is certainly more politically ambitious. He's let his, you know, has said prior to his appointment that he did have higher office aspirations. He's since toned those down because he knows how the game is played in the Kremlin. Uh, but Shoigu has better connections, including the most important connection, he's friends with Putin. So my guess, if Putin decides to say, enough, father, I'm tired of being the boss, the guy he's going to nod on could very well be Sergei Shoigu. Uh, but, as you know, that Putin is conceivably in office until 2024, when his second six-year term ends. So we Kremlinologists don't have to worry about that for another 10 years yet. That's all my remarks. Thank you.